I've noticed that there's been what seems to me to be an increase in like very vitriolic responses on his behalf, which I hadn't seen, you know, and obviously there are, there are, you know, maps of meaning, like you said, is not of a political nature, but still, even in the past, when he would be in conversation with students at the University of Toronto on trans issues, for example, I didn't see that same vitriol. I didn't see that same sort of like, you know, F you sentiment. What's up, everyone? As many of you know, I've been somewhat critical of Dr. Jordan Peterson lately, given what seems to be his sudden turn away from brilliantly explaining how archetypal symbols universal to the human experience can guide us in these contemporary times. He's gone from talking about that to what seems to be a full-throttled acceptance of a paradigm which perceives all of reality as a culture war that must be waged against the left using all available weapons. I wrote a piece in Substack about this, which you can find in the links below on YouTube, but I also got the opportunity to expand on this in a recent talk with Brett. Brett is currently pursuing a PhD in evolutionary psychology at the University of New Mexico, and he has spoken with many thought leaders in this field, including the legendary John Verveke, Paul Vanderclay, and Karen Wong. In this podcast, Brett and I spoke about our mutual love of Dr. Peterson's epic book, Maps of Meaning, and why we still believe he can use those insights to help guide us through the fog. Um, I'm Chloe Valdery. I have a startup called Theory of Enchantment. We do uh, anti-racism work that really is rooted in a compassionate, love-based uh, approach. I also have a podcast called The Heart Speaks, and um, I'm excited to be in conversation with you. Cool. Yeah, so uh, for your audience who definitely doesn't know who I am, so my name is Brett Anderson. I'm a, a PhD student at the University of New Mexico. I study evolutionary psychology there. Uh, what I really do research on is something called the, the diametric model of autism hmm. and psychosis. Uh, we won't be talking about that today. Uh, I'm also sort of relevant to this conversation. I'm sort of slowly but surely working on a book that is in large part an extension of the thesis from, from Jordan Peterson's first book, Maps of Meaning. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what we're here to talk about is, is Jordan. That's kind of what I, what I asked you to talk about. You've, you've uh, made some comments on Twitter and elsewhere. Uh, sort of indicates that your sentiments are, are pretty closely aligned with mine. And um, so to just give a little bit of background about where I'm coming from with these things, you know, Jordan, uh, Jordan says all the time that he gets these, he gets tens of thousands of letters from people telling him some version of this, of this story that they were in a dark place and that uh, through listening to his lectures, they were able to kind of pull themselves out of that, right? And I believe him when he says that, because that's precisely what happened to me, right? So in my early 20s, I was uh, I had a pretty rough time in my early 20s, and Jordan's lectures were instrumental in helping me to to put myself back together. And so Jordan has had a huge effect on my life, not only personally, but also you know intellectually, because a lot of my work is really building off of the work that he does. Um, and so I really have nothing but but sort of love and gratitude for Jordan. Um, and at the same time, uh, yeah. at the same time, I've become increasingly disillusion with, you know, with some of the stuff that he's putting out there over the last two or three, maybe probably ever since he came back from his illness, really, I think is sort of when it started. And all of that kind mm. of go ahead uh, with David Fuller's article, you know, David Fuller's article, and I know you read it and commented on it. And uh, I thought that he was really giving voice to something that a lot of us had been thinking. And it's it's interesting to me because, you know, both you and I and David, I think, are all predisposed to be sympathetic towards Jordan because I think he's had a yeah. impact on all of us. And yet we're all kind of feeling the same way about it. And so, you know, my question for you, Chloe, uh, is, you know, from your perspective, what happened, right? It's like, what's going on? <laughs> why, you know, why, why do we see this sort of shift in Jordan's audience, the shift with Jordan? Yeah, what, what happened? So I'm not exactly sure what happened, but I do think that there's a quote from Maya Angelou that I teach all the time in Theory of Enchantment that might be relevant here, which is that if you tell someone over and over again that they're nothing, they eventually will say to you, oh, you think I am nothing. I will show you what nothing is. 
And I do have a sense that with Jordan Peterson, especially in combination with some of the personal things that he went through with his wife getting sick with him, you know, weaning off the addiction to the drugs that he was addicted to all of those combined with the fact that there are constantly people, yes, who were fans, but also tens of thousands of people who are not fans who are saying to him, you're basically trash. I think it's possible that that caused him to sort of like double down and feel, you know, threatened and feel like he didn't have a lot of space to maneuver emotionally. Um, Ironically, you know, I did read Maps of Meaning. Maps of Meaning is actually the only book by Jordan Peterson I've read. Um, But I remember him talking about sort of like the tyrannical king who one of the characteristics of the tyrannical king is that they become super, super rigid and they don't want to introduce anything new into sort of the atmosphere or the environment. Um, They become obsessed with conserving the old way. And I think you're seeing a little bit of that in Jordan, perhaps as a defensive mechanism in response to people who are telling him that he's trash. Yeah. So it's really funny you say that I I've had the same thought, you know, and, and maybe as as a defense mechanism, but also, you know, Jordan is getting older and like, I Mm. think that it's potentially the case that as you get older, you sort of take on that role of the, of the sort of defender of order, right. The defender of Mm. of the old ways. And, you know, when Jordan was, you know, maps of meaning is not a conservative book at all. Yeah. It's not a political book, you know, it's, it's meta political in some sense. And, uh, and so I, I see maps of meaning as being sort of nonpartisan, like truly mm-hmm. nonpartisan. Uh, but Jordan has definitely taken on that sort of conservative role, you know, and mm-hmm. lately. And yeah, I think you're right. You know, there's something to that. Uh, like Jordan's in a very strange position, right? Because I don't mm. think anybody has ever been in the position that he's in where he's, you know, he's the most famous public intellectual in the world, right? As, yeah. as we're coming into this era of YouTube and Twitter and all this. And he's polarizing in a way that almost nobody is, right? Because mm-hmm. he has, on the one hand, a bunch of people like me who are like, Jordan, you saved my life. You mm-hmm. know, a bunch of people who are like, Jordan, you're the worst. You're, you're basically Satan incarnate, right? Yeah. So that, that you know, I have no clue how I would react to that. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very sort of sympathetic towards Jordan in that regard, because I don't think any of us know how we would really react to that situation. Sure. That's and, a fair response. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, he's very self-aware about these things too. I, I watched his recent video, you know, and he, it, it's, it's very interesting. He, he's definitely taking on like people have not reacted well to his recent sort of scripted videos. Is this the one where he reads from the, from the script, but he says that pe- he knows that people haven't reacted well. Yeah. And he sort of like says he's trying to experiment with something. I watched like the first third of it and then I stopped because it was, it was still the same, more of the same for me. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I thought it was I thought it was better. Um, the problem, you know, with saying things like up yours, woke moralists. Well, yeah, you know, it doesn't, <laughs> yeah, it sound cool when you're reading it from a script. You know, it might mm-hmm. sound cool in the moment if you're like in a debate, you know, maybe. But it just sounds really bad when you're reading it from a script. Yeah, it's also not his like with regards to that last video and also with regards to like the commentary that he gave on the Sports Illustrated. Uh, model and then him doubling down in his comments with Michaela, you know, basically cursing out people who disagreed with him. I've noticed that there's been what seems to me to be an increase in like very vitriolic responses on his behalf, which I hadn't seen, you know, and obviously there are, there are, you know, maps of meaning, like you said, is not of a political nature, but still, even in the past, when he would be in conversation with students at the University of Toronto on trans issues, for example, I didn't see that same vitriol. I didn't see that same sort of like, you know, F you sentiment that I see now. And that's why I'm, I, I think of like the tyrant father archetype, because it's very, uh, it's very reminiscent of that. Yeah, it is. And is it, yeah, Jordan has always had that sort of streak, right? That sort of uh, very, in, you know, even on Twitter, you know, he like sort of at the very beginning of all this, he, uh, he said that he wanted to slap that guy, you know? Who, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Think, um, you know, these things, they don't come off well on Twitter and in, in my, yeah. they, that, that sort of, like you can kind of get away with it in a lecture because you can put a little bit of irony behind it. And yeah. You're 
tone of voice and all this uh, in text, it just sounds really bad. And it, it doesn't, con- you know, the, one of the issues with it is that it doesn't convince anybody who disagrees with you, right? It just mm-hmm. drives them farther away. You know? mm-hmm. uh, it just makes you look like an asshole to them really. Yeah. yeah. There's also, there's also what seems to me to be like a literalist streak uh, in Jordan Peterson, which is so ironic since in Maps of Meaning in particular, he like expands on, you know, these metaphors and these archetypal patterns that we use to, or at least, you know, symbolic patterns that we use to try to discern truth. And that I think is very different from a, a more literalist sort of, um, you know, unironic use of rhetoric and, and dialogue. And I do think there's a way to use rhetoric, ironically, even on platforms like Twitter. But it seems to me that that literalism is also a characteristic of, I mean, that rigid rigidity that I spoke about earlier. I, I was curious, have you read Beyond Order and Chaos? I actually haven't read it. I read uh, I read 12 Rules, 12 Rules for Life. I did not read the second one. I didn't I didn't really okay. like 12 Rules for Life. And it's not that okay. it was a bad book. It was just that uh, I'd heard it all before, you know, it's like yeah. meaning was sort of the technical, you know, it's all, yeah, it's all sort of building off of, off of maps of meaning. And yeah, I found that, you know, more stimulating, I guess. Yeah, uh, that's fair. When, uh, so when you, when you talk about the literalism, do you have an example of that? Like, what do you, uh, what you, um, you know, I wrote a piece in my sub stack about his response to sports illustrated magazine and I understood where he was coming from, but I also feel like um, beauty can often be uh, illusory or, you know, beyond skin deep, so to speak. And I told the story about how I saw this woman outside my my house who was this elderly woman who had a kind of a crippling um, like her her leg was crippled. And it was a really hot summer day in New York. And, you know, I wanted to make sure she was okay that, you know, she, if she needed my help for anything, I could assist her. And when I spoke to her, she had this sort of like bon vivant, you know, like attitude, this very like open, generous attitude. And we had a very brief exchange, but there was something fundamentally beautiful about her being that had nothing to do with necessarily the way she looked. Right. And, and Jordan Peterson of all people I would expect should be able to uh, invite us into a conversation about beauty that's rooted in that. But instead of going in that direction, instead of going in sort of the symbol, symbolic, you know, meanings of beauty, deeper meanings of beauty, he just pulled out a very literalist interpretation of beauty, um, which he claimed to be objective, but obviously it's very subjective. Um, in many ways, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But also his entire calculation it seemed to me in that moment was simply to sort of like the equivalent of owning the libs which is like owning the mega corporations that are transmitting images for you know profit or whatever um but he didn't calculate like other nuances that were a part of that that equation um or could could be part of the conversation if he just brought that to the fore so that's an example that comes up when i think of like him being very very literal as opposed to giving people the opportunity to actually expand their understanding of beauty and their definition of beauty. But that's the problem. If you're, and I think this is true for Jordan, if your identity becomes counter dependent, if it becomes dependent upon countering the other. And I think that that's what we've seen in, in Jordan Peterson over the last year and a half, maybe then not only will you not be, um, not only will you want, will you not want to sort of be nuanced, you will start to see nuance as a very threat to your identity and what you stand for. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's, I think you're hitting the nail on the head there. I mean, I, you know, the way I've looked at it is that it seems like Jordan is viewing almost everything through the lens of the culture war and it mm-hmm. distorts, right. It distorts your, your, your vision of things. Like, uh, you know, you, you said something a while back about Idris Elba and, and James mm-hmm. Bond, right. And Jordan's tweet about that. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was so weird. I know, yeah. Too. Like, to, you know, I, it's like, I know the heuristic that Jordan is using. I right. we do see this, right? We do see this sort of like forced diversity thing that happens. Yeah. It's, but this is not what was going on with James Bond, in my opinion. It yeah. is, is like a perfect James Bond, you know, to me. Yeah. I think he, like, I think he really does uh, come off as like a, as like a really good James Bond. And so 
it's one of those examples of like when you view everything everything through that lens, it does distort your view of the world to some degree. And um, you know, another another recent one, and this was actually it was actually after looking at this tweet that I emailed you because mm. uh, okay. it, was, it was a tweet. It, it was like the the tweet that broke the camel's back for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was um he tweeted about this Scientific American article by Lisa Feldman Barrett. Okay. She uh, so Lisa Feldman Barrett has this theory of emotions. It's like the theory of constructed emotions. And she wrote a, a Scientific American art article about it. And Jordan tweeted, you know, he said something about, you know, he called her a random columnist. He called it woke idiocy. And he implied that it was Marxist propaganda. And the problem with that, you know, is that Lisa Feldman Barrett has 75,000 citations. She has an 18 <laughs> of 126. She's yeah. 18, but random, right? She's like, yeah. uh, you know, whether you agree with her or theory or not, she's considered a leading expert on the issue. And uh, she's about as woke as anybody else, but as any other psychologist. But um, yeah, yeah, it, it deserves a, a real critique. I think her theory is wrong. But what is her theory? I don't know where her theory is. Yeah. So she doesn't believe necessarily in universal emotions. Uh, so she believes that uh, emotions are constructed from smaller, let's say, like sort of smaller reactions to things. It's something like that. So like uh, uh, affective neuroscience by Pansek, uh, by mm -hmm. Young and So he sort of laid out the evidence from the animal literature that there is like universal emotions that are present in all mammals. We all feel okay. fear. We all fear, you know, feel, uh, feel uh, like curiosity and things like that. Uh, she says, no, these are, these are like amount, these are like amalgamations that we're projecting onto people and they're, cult they're culturally constructed. Oh, uh, very Rousseauian, it sounds. Very Rousseauian, <laughs> yes. It's very yeah. Rousseauian, uh, very much on that sort of social constructivist side of things. Uh, yeah. Obviously, Jordan doesn't agree with that. I don't agree with it either, but it's, she's a serious scientist and deserves mm -hmm. a response, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, one, one other thing I wanted to talk about here is like why we're talking about this, because yeah, I think it's, you know, I think it's important to sort of nail that down because it's, it is weird to me to just talk about somebody. Uh, you know, it's not like <laughs> yeah. I you know, yeah. <laughs> gossip when I can, yeah. uh, but it's important at least for me, because, you know, Jordan has played such a large role in my life and a large role in a lot of people's lives. And, yeah, uh, and like, trying to figure out, you know, because I'm, I'm writing this book and, and my, my work is, is based on Jordan's work and trying to figure out, you know, how to deal with being critical of some, you know, mm -hmm. like that it's like, a, you know, how do we navigate this, this situation where this person who has had such a positive effect is also, uh, also, I don't know, needs criticism. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. What, you know what I mean? Like, so I, I guess from your perspective, like, what's the point of talking about this? Um, I think for me, especially when I, so I first watched Maps of Meaning from his lecture uh, series from, I think it was either 2013 or 2017. Um, and then I read the book and both of those pieces of content really like blew me away. I was like, so enamored in many ways that series led me to want to explore Carl Jung and his work more and other uh, colleagues of Carl Jung. Um, and so I'm really grateful for that uh, sort of portal and sort of archetypal symbolism. And I think that Jordan Peterson is a figure who is needed, that part of him is needed now more than ever, given the chaos, as he would say, that we are all encountering as a society. And so my criticism of him is, you know, always in service of the second principle. At least I try to make it be in service of the second principle of theory of enchantment, which is criticized to uplift and empower, never to tear down or destroy. And it's very disheartening to see this figure who, you know, is like a public phenomenon <laughs> um, sort of fall from grace in the way that he's falling. And it's also disheartening to see him, I mean, it's understandable also, but it's disheartening to see him gravitate towards entities that have a very zero-sum game. Like, I know that he joined forces with Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro's outfit, and I don't see how Ben Shapiro has any incentive whatsoever to 
you know, um, show good faith for his political opponents or to his political opponents to reach across the aisle. Like there's no incentive insofar as I can tell how his brand is set up for that to happen. Um, but there, but there is an incentive. I mean, that was always part of, at least as I perceived it, Jordan Peterson's way of being. And I think we need that now more than ever, especially when we're dealing with incredible amounts of polarization, which is a sort of kind of an emotional scarcity combined with material forms of scarcity, certainly here in the United States in the forms of inflation and things like that. So I just think we need a figure. We need like 2017 Jordan Peterson (laughs) to resurrect. Um, And without that voice, there's a void uh, and someone will fill that void. And and if we're not careful, someone of of very, um, I think, negative motives will fill that void. Yeah, I I totally agree. And um, yeah, the, you know, the thing, the Daily Wire thing, you know, I, I, I kind of understood Jordan's, you know, justification for it. They gave him a lot of money, you know, and they, yeah. uh, you know, and it, like there's, you know, that's, that's a real benefit to some degree, but, yeah. uh, um, but also Jordan doesn't need the production. Like, you know, the, 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 he doesn't need all this production value, right? Like the yeah. of Jordan Peterson was just him standing in front of a camera in front of his classroom. Right. Yeah. Like, it's a, he doesn't, he doesn't need all of that in my opinion. And the thing about aligning yourself with that, with a conservative organization is, um, is that I, I think it is going to exacerbate, you know, this polarization to some degree. And yeah, we, we see this split. I mean, I think a part of the split in Jordan's audience are, are people who, you know, it's between people who primarily saw Jordan as a political ally, mm-hmm. uh, you know, people like Ben Shapiro and Charlie Kirk, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're, conservative to the core and they saw Jordan as a political ally. Right. And then, yeah. you know, people like, I think you and me and David Fuller, that was not it. Right. It wasn't yeah. really like that. You know, it was, you know, he was a, a repository of wisdom in some, in some sense and, and really mm-hmm. a political uh, wisdom. And so I, I'm not, yeah, I, I think it's a bad idea, you know, to, to try to, uh, well, it, it's, it, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. So, yeah, uh, if you, you know, you, you you've said things that are critical of Jordan. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you could give him advice, if you were to watch this and you were to give him <laughs> advice, like, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a strange thing because, like, well, we're not in his position, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's obviously a smart guy, but you know, what what should Jordan do? Um, I would say that. <laughs> Let me think about this for a second. Um, have you seen the rise of Jordan Peterson, the documentary? It's been a while, but yeah, I saw it. So I think that's a great documentary. And you know, the scene where he sort of, you see that he's like obsessed with the world's dictators. Like he has photos of the world's dictators all around his house. And he's, obsessed with not becoming like them right or like uh being sending a a clarion call to the world so that the world doesn't become like them um if i were to try to do a jungian analysis of that (laughs) i would like very like in a botched way obviously i would suggest that like this is a part of jordan's shadow Right. And everything that we know from Jungian sort of approaches to psychology is like, you don't want to suppress your shadow. You want to get in right relationship with it. Right. You want to um, dialogue with it, but you don't want to suppress it because if you suppress it, it'll end up unconsciously making itself manifest. And so I think there's a little bit of that happening here. Um, So I would suggest that he do some shadow work and do some work where he like identifies where like the worst parts and he, this is advice that he would get. He has given this advice, right? Identify where the worst parts of your enemies exist in yourself. Right. And be in relationship with that. And the second thing I would say, and um, this might be a hot take, but I'm just going to say it. I think that Jordan Peterson is lacking aspects of the divine feminine. I think that he has lectured many times upon, on the importance of, you know, healthy masculinity and um, having a balanced masculinity. And I think that's wonderful. And I think that's very necessary. But I think 
but I think what's missing is a, is a proper relationship with the divine feminine. Um, it's interesting that he has defined the feminine as chaos, as I'm sure, you know, you've seen this in other interviews. Um, but in fact, another word for chaos is simply the unknown. Right. And so I, I think that because he's doubled down and become super rigid and has confined himself to the perception that he is at war, right? That is the automatic shutting down of a proper relationship with the unknown, right? Anything, and what that means is that that automatic adoption of, her, of a heuristic that you can like place anything into, right? As opposed to being curious um, about different things as they come up in present time. So I would say two things, work on your shadow and you got to reorient your relationship with the divine feminine, that yin, that yin energy, right. In the yin yang system. Um, those are two things that I would, that I would ask of Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, and, and it, yeah, if, if I were to give him advice as a friend, not that he needs my advice, right. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a passage from Nietzsche, right. Mm. Um, called on the flies of the market. And I, mm. I would love for Jordan to read that because I'm okay. sure at some point, but um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, Nietzsche is getting at what happened with Jordan and, and Nietzsche's point in that passage is like that when you go out into the marketplace of ideas, people demand of you that you have a position on everything, right? People yeah. demand of you that you have, you have to be either for or against this, right? And if you're not yeah. wishy-washy, they punish you for that. Or you get right. punished for being wishy-washy. But the problem is, that if you're somebody who is really like after truth, right, you have to be, you have to maintain a certain amount of uncertainty about things, especially if you're not an expert on them, right? And so right. Um, I think that, I think that Jordan has sort of fallen into, potentially fallen into this sort of, this sort of trap of needing to have a, a strong opinion about everything. Mm. Well, you know what I mean? You don't, yeah. you don't, you, you don't want to have opinions about everything. Um, yeah. And also, you know, one of the things that Nietzsche, you know, says in there is like, it's not your lot to shoe flies, right? And what he means by that is like, and really it, it applies to Twitter, right? Because mm. Jordan has had this um, habit of responding to like these trolls with a hundred followers. You know what I mean? Like, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, like people are just out to make him mad. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, no, like they're just, you know, they're gnats, right? They're gnats. I think, I think he responds to them though. And this is like, another irony i think he responds to them because i think he's actually deeply sensitive and hurt by what they say which is crazy to a certain extent because some of them are literally bots and not actual real people um but yeah i think that there's a there's a little bit of sadness and sorrow in being you know attacked on on social media you are you reminded me actually another thing i would ask jordan peterson to think about is the fact that like when celebrities become celebrities masses of people will project their own sort of image onto this celebrity right and that's very dangerous if you are in that position of fame and status and you have to be aware that that's very dangerous because no one person can take on the projections of millions of people some some have said that like this is the psychological reason behind why Marilyn Monroe passed away at such an early age is because all these people, particularly men, were projecting their image of, her, of, of, or their fantasy of her onto her. And the thing is, Jordan Peterson, and I'm sure he knows this, but Jordan Peterson is not actually a God, right? right? He's devil, a human right? being, right. <laughs> or the devil, right? right? He's a human being with flaws and warts like all of us. And I would, you know, he, he announced that he's off Twitter now, but he announced like he would be off Twitter. He would send his people to tweet on his behalf, but I would have suggested that he completely get off Twitter, right? Like no staff tweeting on his behalf. I have in the past taken, you know, month long breaks from Twitter because you really start to see how that platform actually reorients your cognitive, like relationship to the world. Um, and it's very us versus them. It can like draw you in easily into that mindset, into that binary. So yeah, there's so many factors at play here that lead to the potential of Jordan Peterson's downfall. And so he has to be like on guard for all of those. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the leading Twitter would probably, be <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, it's like, it's such a, you know, I've had, 
uh, I've had a, an anonymous Twitter account where I had about three or 4,000 followers. And it was, and I, I was tweeting about relatively controversial, like evolutionary psychology stuff. And okay. it was so toxic, you know, and it, and it, uh, and it, and it occupied so much of my mind because I had, yeah. you know, even, even, even when I was anonymous, right. And, uh, people tweeting that I was like, you know, just calling me the worst names you can imagine yeah, you know, and all that. And like that actually, like, there's no, even, and I'm not a sensitive person. Like I'm not a very neurotic person. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't matter. Like we're, we're hardwired because, you know, in our, in the environment in which we evolved, if you have people who hate your guts, there's a good chance that they're going to stab you in your sleep. Right. Right. Yeah. On Twitter, it doesn't matter, but it, we, we react to it in the same way. And so right. no, I just don't think there's any way you can interact with Twitter uh, in that way and get away with it. Like people who I think maybe do it right. Or people like Sam Harris and mm. uh, Joe Rogan, you know, they just post stuff. They never interact right they never mm. you know, they just post their content and go yeah pretty much um and yeah i think that's the best way to do it and you know but jordan part of part of the magic of jordan is his impulsivity i think because mm. uh most academics are not very good like right and sure part of it is they're, they're just kind of boring and they don't you know there's not there's no real passion there uh part of the reason why jordan is such a good lecturer is because he has this kind of temperament, I think, you know, this sort of mm. impulsive, um, firebrand kind of temperament, but it, it also has that dark side, right? Where you can fall. Yeah. But it also doesn't necessarily translate well on Twitter. I know you've spoken to John Verveke, who I'm a huge fan of. Um, and I feel like Verveke would say that like the lexic the lexiconic structure of Twitter it is such that, you know, if if you can't hear tone, right? You can't you can't really see see context to a certain extent, and so you have to just be aware of the landscape that you're entering in. And you know, I struggle with this too because I want to be on Twitter and I want to promote certain messages on Twitter, but I also recognize how being for Twitter being on Twitter for too long can like get me into like a dopamine addiction loop. I've also been. Uh, I just started researching the works of Jordan Hall. I don't know if you're familiar with his stuff. Oh, he is. Okay. Um, yeah, but he's all he's all about like like there's culture or or I guess in the context of this conversation, there's politics and then there's like what transcends politics. Yep. And I think he would say that it's easy for platforms like Twitter to get us into like a reciprocal narrowing uh headspace without obviously realizing it. And that stops us from transcending to that meta level or that transcendent level of that goes above politics. Um, and it's really sad because on some level you could argue that this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, just the way these factors combine with around Jordan Peterson. Um, I, I also like, I, I wonder like if he has a lot of friends, not fans, Mm -hmm. friends right like and what role does that play in his life no this is something i've thought about too and and of course i don't i don't know but you know he's a powerful person and yeah the people who people around him they are dependent on him to some degree and that's a problem right. because it makes it very difficult if you're if you're dependent on somebody with you know with that much power and you know he, he does have he does have a lot of power it's hard to criticize right yeah to be really to really t you know uh, even if you're very well-meaning, right? It's hard to yeah. criticize him. And so I wonder, you know, Jordan, and this is, I mean, Jordan gets all sorts of criticism from people who hate his guts. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I wonder how much criticism he gets from people who really love him. And, yeah. you know, and, and I, probably not much. And, you know, I look at Michaela, who he seems to be very close to. Mm -hmm. um, Michaela's response to David Fuller's article was a little bit telling for me because she, you know, she called him a coward or she mm -hmm. said that, um, it was, you know, she, she implied that it was cowardly and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I, I have nothing against Michaela, but I, I, I suspect that she sort of drives him to the extent that they, I suspect she sort of drives him to being the sort of right wing firebrand type mm. uh, to some degree and, and probably is not fond of that kind of criticism, but yeah, it, it's, it's a problem, right? So like, yeah. um, if you're in that powerful position, how do you cultivate friends who will be honest with you, be real with you. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine you'd have to do so deliberately and with intention. 
Um, you know, Michaela has also been through some stuff and I feel like her, like, for example, health issues have perhaps brought, given her an empathy with which to understand her father who also had health issues. And of course, like that would naturally draw them closer and closer. But if you add on top of that, you know, people attacking you, the, the temptation to just, you know, sign everyone off who doesn't agree with you is very large and very high. And yeah, I know I keep saying this, but it's just sad. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is sad. Well, I mean, that's, that's part of the reason, you know, why I kind of reached out to you is like, it's, it is sad, you know, and, and, uh, yeah. um, and I, I don't know, I mean, you know, I'm, sh- you know, maybe Jordan will sort of turn the ship around. I think there's some signs yeah. that happen, but, um, yeah, you never know. Yeah. So, uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, I did want to ask you since you brought it up about the divine feminine. Uh, mm-hmm. So the name of my book is actually the return of the great mother. And that's the name. Oh, wow. Yeah. So okay. uh, it is about this issue. And so I'm yeah. curious uh, what it, you know, culturally speaking, uh, have we lost mm. the divine feminine? And if so, maybe, maybe not, but if so, how would we reincorporate that into your mind? So I, I've just started reading a bunch of stuff about this in the past maybe eight months. So I'm very ignorant. <laughs> I'll, I'll start by saying that. Um, but my read of it is very interesting. My understanding is, broadly speaking, is that for the first 2,500 years of the human species, the primary deities that were worshipped were all women, essentially. And that created a sort of way of being which has its critiques for sure. Like Camille Paglia has plenty of critiques of that sort of way of being, if anyone's interested in checking that out. But then that sort of was swept away with the rise of more patriarchal deities. Um, And many Jungian scholars like Marianne Woodman would argue that like what is needed for this sort of next phase or a higher state of consciousness among human beings is a balancing of the divine feminine with the divine masculine the sort of attributes that have been associated with masculine deities to be integrated with those that have been that have been associated with feminine deities and so what does that look like practically speaking it looks like uh, the development of a capacity in society to be with what is as opposed to need to constantly do 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 and especially you know speaking particularly of the west Um, so for example, take Jordan Peterson, right? Um, instead of reacting to, to, let's say someone, um, saying something very nasty to him on Twitter or wherever, he can choose to practice being with the feeling of experiencing that nastiness and then metacognitively go out, sort of reach, go up into sort of a stoic move go up into, oh, this is what it feels like to feel persecuted, or this is what it feels like to feel um, humiliated, and use that as a way to actually cultivate empathy for people, of course, across the political spectrum who have ever felt humiliated or persecuted in their lives for whatever reason. That capacity to sit with the feeling, to contemplate the feeling, as opposed to trying to suppress the feeling or do something in response to the feeling, that would be an aspect of the divine feminine. And um, I was going to say something else. Uh, I don't remember, but if he, if he does that and learns how to like harmonize the two, then I think that could be an incredible model for us as, as a civilization, as a species for, for where to go, but but ever since I would say, you know, prior definitely prior to the Enlightenment, but let's just use the Enlightenment as a kind of historical epic. Ever since the Enlightenment, the the cultural sort of move has been to try to, you know, beat back disorder, to beat back quote unquote chaos, to superimpose these very rigid boundaries that enable us to make sense of the world and there are obviously benefits to that, but there's also losses to that. And, you know, it's interesting that different religious traditions will, will have their own takes on this. So for example, I don't know if anyone would be interested 
there's a great book called um uh what's it called oh man it's a it's a actually a analysis of judaism and it is was written by a Jungian named Eric Newman. Some some say that if he, he would have lived longer, he would have rivaled Jung um, as the next best Jungian. But Eric Newman wrote a book, two part series on on Judaism, where he talks about sort of the need for the return of the divine feminine within Judaism and and where it was initially and how to um, how to get it back. He also wrote an incredible book called Fear of the Feminine, which is a broadly broadly speaking about the absence of the feminine in in societies uh, so i would like check out his stuff i would check out marianne woodman's book uh well she has many but one of them is addicted to perfection um so there's like all these different things i'm reading that i'm sort of synthesizing that are giving me a sort of broader picture of what the divine feminine is because the truth of the matter is that as a species we have never lived through a period where both were in harmony with each other the divine masculine and the divine feminine and i think like that's where we want to go as a society but i'm curious like what the premise of your book is yeah well i think you uh i mean you touched on a few of the things so it's important to differentiate between goddess worship and matriarchy because this mm. is something that has been confused by feminist scholars in my opinion so mm. uh, i think it is clearly the case that goddess worship was extremely important uh in the period sort of right after the advent of agriculture and maybe preceding mm. the advent of agriculture a little bit and there's a very good book um, called Did God Have a Wife? Mm. By, uh, written by an Israeli archaeologist. And, cool. Yeah. And so what he what he shows in that book. So like when you um, they find these figurines throughout Israel uh, of this goddess of like this this feminine figure. Uh, yeah. They find barely any masculine figure. Right? Mm. And and, um, and and there's a there's a variety of other evidence. You can look in like the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament, they they talk about Asherah, Asherah, mm. um, the feminine, the mother goddess, essentially, and uh, it's a it's a heresy essentially to worship Asherah. Mm. It's evidence, right? I mean, he considers this evidence of just how widespread it was. Because, right, right. You know, like they they wanted to suppress it, but they they you know they had to mention it just because it was so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, so it was like this was like the religion of the people, essentially. You know, the, mm. the sort of. Um, Yahweh worshiping religion, he argues, was a religion that was really more for the male literate. Mm. Um, anyway, so we have this suppression of the feminine from like the, the Judaism side. And then on the Greek side, there's actually some evidence that um, Minoan Crate was a goddess worshiping culture. But I think uh, the, the archaeological evidence there isn't as, isn't as clear. But we see on the Greek side this, um, this is something that Nietzsche talked about a lot, you know, this, this elevation of reason. Right, this elevation, mm, yeah, of logic and reason over embodied intuition and, and instinct, and yeah, uh, it's a very, it's a very masculine way of doing epistemology in some sense. It's a, a mm -hmm. somewhat, um, I would call, you know, so my research is on autism and psychosis. It's a relatively autistic way of thinking about uh, mm -hmm. knowledge and and relatively masculine. And so we have from sort of both of our cultural heritages, right? We've we've inherited this. Um, this very masculine way of looking at the world. And also at the same time, we have, so, you know, I think that what we, what we might call wokeness, I don't think mm -hmm. there's a good word for this thing, whatever it is, but well, yeah. wokeness, right. Uh, it's like, a, it's like the revenge of the feminine, right. It's like, mm. uh, like this, this hyper reaction to this long standing masculine bias in Western culture. And yeah. it's not, good i mean it's like the you know it is this hypertrophy of compassion yeah instead of reason it's like you know too much compassion uh but anyways um and it well uh the reason it's called the return of the great mother is is partly because of that right is because you know we suppressed that whole aspect of our epistemology and and mm -hmm. the world and um you you hit the nail on the head when you said we we've, we've tried to like impose order Mm -hmm. uh, we've lost touch with chaos, right? We've lost our, our, and we see this, you know, like Jonathan Haidt, uh, his recent book, The Coddling of the American Mind, mm -hmm. really about like this safetyism, right? This, this desire, yeah. everything's safe. Nassim Nicholas Taleb, or yeah, Nassim Taleb wrote the book, Anti-Fragile, right? It's the same mm -hmm. thing, right? trying to suppress chaos at all, at all points. And, uh, yeah, I'm very curious about like, um, 
first of all, I want to I want to read your book. <laughs> so let awesome. me know when that when that yeah. is out. Uh, fair enough. Yeah. Um, and if you have any other book recommendations, please send them to me. Um, but I'm very curious. I started researching the etymology of the word save because you know that term is so pervasive in our culture. Obviously, given our Christian heritage as a civilization, you know, sort of salvation saving but then i was like but it's also like everywhere in like our economics like we're trying to encourage people to save money right to um you know use this coupon and save 50 percent. it's like everywhere this language of saving and i'm wondering like the the what if anything that has to do with maybe like a savior complex within the west but all the the word is safe like the word save comes from the same word that birthed the word safe um and i don't know if there's a there there but it's it's interesting to think about the other thing i'll say is that i when in 2020 when a lot of these sort of really weird things were happening in the anti-racism space where like you had you know the smithsonian museum of african-american heritage coming out with these posters that said like whiteness is like showing up on time and um, you know, like, uh, I don't know, using logic. And I, I did start to think like, is this, is this unconsciously a sort of subtle revolt against Descartes and like <laughs> the entire, um, you know, enlightenment approach to, uh, again, trying to impose order on the world, which if so, we need to talk about obviously the excesses of this but also sort of like have that lead to a greater conversation, a meta conversation about civilization and where we've come from as a civilization. And Jordan Peterson would be the perfect person to help us navigate the conversation. But instead he's like, he's like saying like DEI is DIE, you know, on, it's like, there's such an opportunity here to sort of thread the needle actually. And it's, it's being missed out. No, I, I think so. And, and I do think that a lot of that is an un, a relatively unconscious revolt against this hypertrophy of, of that masculine epistemology, like the elevation of reason. Yeah. And all this. Um, uh, you know, Jordan just had this conversation with Ian McGilchrist, and I think the Ian McGilchrist okay. views on this are uh, very pertinent. I mean, um, because Ian, Ian is trying in some sense to revive the, uh, the, the importance of intuition and imagination. Yeah, and at least symbolically, these things are uh, feminine, and mm-hmm. uh, and it, it's also the case that uh, you know it's it's like considered a stereotype now. But like we know, we have good data that like um, you know women do on average at, like think intuitively to some sense more. But mm-hmm. it's an average difference. But um, but yeah, I agree, and and I think that. Yeah, Jordan Jordan has put himself in a position where he can't e- even though, you know, like I thought the podcast with Ian was great and they're and they're getting at this issue and Yeah. Um but in in some ways, you know, Jordan has has closed himself off from being able to talk to the people who need to hear it the most or who want Right. To, right? right. Exactly. Like in my conversation with him at the end of the conversation or near the end of the conversation, we started to talk about music produced in the African American community, right? And like the the move from which is a very intuitive move actually and a, and a move that reflects the capacity to be with what is like the entire creation of the genre of blues is a capacity to be with what is because what what is happening with the development of blues is you have a people that's incredibly sorrowful and instead of like trying to suppress that the people sit with the sorrow and they lament right and then that lamentation becomes music and then you know, Albert Murray says, by singing the, the blues, you get rid of the blues, right? And that's the sort of idea of being with what is. And Jordan has such a, that really resonated with him. Like he, he waxed poetic, right? About the beauty of African-American music and its capacity to do this. And it's like, it's right there, you know, <laughs> just, just, just keep going and thread that needle. And we could have an incredible revolutionary conversation about the things that affect us. But instead, we're sort of being bogged down in these culture wars. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, that's another, like, problem with the way that Jordan has sort of been headed is that I do think that Jordan has very important things to say about this. And I think that, like, what Jordan did in Maps of Meaning, I mean, I, I, 
you know, I'm not exaggerating. I, I don't think when I say that I think it's of monumental importance. I mean, I think yeah. it's something really fundamental. Yeah. The problem is that Jordan is somebody who's, he's not a simple person to understand. And maps of meaning is definitely not simple. Yeah. If you're going to really understand what he has to say, you have to be a little bit charitable. You have to be mm-hmm. come in, into it with the spirit of discovery and charity. The problem with putting yourself in this sort of oppositional stance to like half the population is that it's yeah. you can't be charitable towards somebody if you think they're an asshole, you know? Right. And Jordan or has, even worse, if you think they're a monster, right? right like right, right. Yeah. And, and Jordan has made even reasonable people think that he's a monster. Well, maybe not a monster, but at least an asshole, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with the yeah. And all that, you know, it's like you can be a reasonable person and think that the person who made that tweet is just being a jerk, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? And and so that's part of the reason why it's, it's a, I don't know. I think it's a bad strategic move on his part. Uh, yeah. To role just because what he's done in his career is of, is of such importance and we need people to understand it. They can't understand it if they think that it's coming from the mouth of a, potentially a monster. Right. Yeah. And I think that like, I, I'll use myself, for example, the only context in which I would respond in that way is if I felt I could see myself responding in that way. If I felt like the walls were closing in on me. Right. If I felt like I was like under attack all the time, yeah. that would be the logical, the logical thing from a human level to to do. And it's sad to, to think that that is his lived reality, yeah. you know, because then that means that he doesn't, he isn't aware of like how much, at least from people who love him, like myself, he isn't aware of like how much, we value him and value his ideas even while criticizing him. He's just, he doesn't seem to be taking that in. So. Well, I mean, it's hard, right? You, you have to put up walls to some degree. Like if you, pay yeah. the, you know, if you're in, I, I just, you know, I can't imagine what it would be like to be in that situation where you have a million people telling you that you're the worst thing, you know, since the coronavirus or whatever. Right. It's like, yeah. But you know, as, Something to what you said earlier, a way to put up a wall would actually just be to delete Twitter. <laughs> right. right? No, I think that would be a better way. Like, <laughs> yeah. um, but if you that's the other thing, speaking of savior complexes, right? Like if you feel that you need to save the world from absolute apocalypse and destruction, which I think there's definitely a bit of that within Jordan Peterson, then like how, like deleting Twitter is just yeah. like not right. not a thing. <laughs> No, I agree. So, and, and, you know, part of it is this sort of conundrum you're in as a as a public intellectual because you're expected to always put out new content, right? And yeah. nobody really has that much to say, including. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and so yeah. you're, you're kind of forced to pon- to pontificate about everything, right? And and you know, yeah. in my mind maps of meaning uh, was Jordan's like magnum opus, and you know, his lectures about it and all this. Um, yeah. And so you're kind of, I, I think. Yeah, I think he's potentially in this position where he feels like he he sort of needs to pontificate about global warming and whatever. And, um, yeah, I, I don't I don't know if it's a good idea. I, I'm I'm sort of like torn on that because like he's allowed to have opinions about things, right? Sure. Yeah. Why not? But um, at the same time, it seems like he, it seems like to me, I think he would be more effective being somewhat metapolitical, right? Like yeah. Trying to trying to solve this polarization and meaning crisis rather than the more particular issues of Justin Trudeau and the. Yeah. <laughs> and the truckers. Yeah, okay. exactly. I am realizing also that like, <clears throat> this is another aspect of the divine feminine, which has to do with, um, you know, sort of a metaphor for sitting in the unknown is sitting, sitting with darkness. And if you think about it, if you, if you use the metaphor of like a tree, right. Or, or a plant, you have to plant the seed in rich, dark soil in order for it, for it to grow up into the light. Uh, and so in this sense, it's the dark soil that would be the representation of, of the feminine. And there's this great observation from Michaela Cole, who is an incredible artist in the UK who just won uh, Emmy for Best Limited uh, Writing for a TV series for her show, I May Destroy You, where she said in her speech, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but she said, in an environment, in a culture where people are encouraged to confuse what did she say to confuse um success with basically currently like always being in the limelight 
right? Like, and then she says, do not be afraid to go into the darkness, right? To go, essentially to get off social media, to get off these platforms where you're constantly, and she's, and see what comes to you in the silence. Right. And that is like the return of the divine feminine. Well, that's it's I mean, it's funny you say that that was exactly Nietzsche's advice in the and on the flies of the marketplace. He's mm. like, Go back to your security. Right. Get away from. The yeah. Market. Um, and, and it's because, you know, if you're really after truth, right, if that's really your goal, the marketplace corrupts you. And yeah. It, and I think it inevitably does it just in, just by by being human. Right. And we yeah. are by you know whether we like it or not we are affected by other people's opinions we are affected by you know uh the criticism and the praise that's thrown at us and i i agree like you know go back and and sit in your room alone for another <laughs> for a year or whatever and yeah it happens and i think um that yeah. should be added to the the i don't know how many rules for life there are now but like <laughs> that should be it. like learn how to be alone uh, absolutely you know yeah um it's something that has benefited. I mean, I, you know, I'm a very introverted person, so it's not difficult for me. Yeah. yeah. I think it's been a huge benefit. You know, it's just, uh, being able, you, you really don't, I don't think that you really think in the same way, you know, Jordan says sometimes like, you know, a lot of people need to be in conversation with somebody to think. And that's kind of true. There's, there's part of that, whether it's true, but there's, a, there's also a sense in which you really don't think clearly unless you're alone inside. Mm-hmm. You know? um, yeah, and, and and potentially maybe that's what Jordan needs a lot of. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. So one other thing I wanted to ask you about is, I mean, you read Maps of Meaning mm-hmm. a while ago, but yes, <laughs> a while ago. Okay, okay. I mean, I yeah. so um, yeah. I, I guess you know you you talk you talk about the divine feminine and things like that. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just kind of curious, like when you read Maps of Meaning, what was your, what, like, what was your reaction to it? Um, did you get it? Did you like it? Or? Well, I would actually always recommend to people if they're interested in reading Maps of Meaning to watch the lecture series first, because he writes the way he talks, you know, and I would not have been able to understand it, I'm sure, if I hadn't watched it first. Um, so the, the lectures blew me away, you know, they were like, whoa, like him expedite or ex. Him like just pontificating on the meaning of Pinocchio was like, whoa, you know, like um, really solidified my love and appreciation for Disney. Um, and then when I read the book, it was it was also like a page turner for me because I had already done that sort of groundwork, I guess. One of the most profound pieces in that book was in the end when he talks about sort of he has this image of like the perpetual transcendence of the Buddha sort of into into time and this idea that like you can you're 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 constantly transcending yourself right and that reminded i think i had sometime shortly thereafter read james Cartz's books like finite and infinite games and the religious case against belief which sort of dovetailed or complemented what he was writing and it was beginning of my meditation journey as well. So all of these things were coming into play and it totally helped me reconstruct an epistemology, uh, like a conception of the self, which was then at that time being informed not only by Western thought, but also Buddhist and Eastern thought. So it was just a synthesis uh, that he was able to put together across different cultures, very obviously like similar to Joseph Campbell. Um, I was just, not not only deeply impressed, but also grateful for that presentation of a, a, a meta understanding of reality. And, you know, on some level, I was sort of, I was sort of prone to fall into Jordan Peterson sort of like obsession because this is how I was raised. Like I was raised to like ask, you know, where does Christmas come from? And like unpack all of these ancient, things that became amalgamated into the the holiday we now know as Christmas, right? Like when I saw Bill Maher's documentary, Religious, I don't know if you've seen it, sort of making fun of religion. Um, ironically, he makes some of the same points that Jordan Peterson makes about Christianity, but he sort of like misses the point, <laughs> you know? Um, 
so yeah, I was just very grateful for for being exposed to such a a wide expanse of a of a explanation of reality itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it took me. I had to read it twice, really, to get it. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of read it in like ten minute spurts, and then uh, you know, but I came back to it a, a year and a half later. And the second time I read it, it was like uh, just you know, just insight after. I mean, it was just sort of mind blowing that it all yeah. came together. And um, yeah, I mean, I see it. You know, I think that what he did largely in that book was respond to Nietzsche's call. You know, you know, Nietzsche mm. declared the death of God, and and Nietzsche was a critic of, of what he called morality, right? Mm. What, what Nietzsche means by morality is not necessarily what we mean by, by morality. You know, Nietzsche means this like externally imposed rules from a transcendent God, right? Mm. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's talking about um, morality is like being objectively imposed on you. Yeah. That it's clear, you know, from reading Nietzsche that he wanted to shift us. And I think this is like the key to reading Nietzsche. Um uh, mm. Anytime he criticizes something, he's not criticizing it with the purpose of like destroying it. He's criticizing it with the purpose of trying to shift our understanding of it from one of stasis and substance to process and flow. Mm. And mm. It's what he was trying to do with morality as well. And I, I see Jordan as conceptualizing morality as a process in that book. Yeah. Right? So, so, so was he making the same argument as sort of like Paul Tillich made in um, the courage to be where he basically argues that atheism is an, a, a logical outcome of sort of an unnecessary revolt against a, um, a conception of God as like the, the most supreme objective being, because what that does is that turns human beings into subjects and human beings can't take that. And Paul Tillich argues that like world war two is well, both world wars, but particularly world war two was like a, a a like an example of Europe just like losing its mind over that conception that that existential conception of its relationship with a higher power um on some level and interesting that you say that so say what you just said because this idea of like you know superimposing laws on a population is like an absence of the divine feminine. Absolutely. And and Eric Newman makes this point in his two-part series on Judaism. He argues that like the the fact that there's there, there were always two sort of like forces within Judaism. There was the priestly class, which would probably be the equivalent of the rabbinical class today, and the prophetic class. And the prophetic class was the class that represented the divine feminine. Um, but with the absence, with the sort of downfall of the prophetic class after the destruction of the second temple and the absence of that within Judaism, you, you saw this like very rigid, uh, following of laws sort of superimposed from above without that creative spirit that comes from the divine feminine. So I should read Nietzsche. <laughs> Well, I guess in conclusion. Nietzsche, yeah, I mean, and and what I actually recommend for people is like, no, don't read Nietzsche. Read some of the secondary literature. About okay. It. Like <laughs> it's, it's much easier to get into Nietzsche once you do that. Yeah. But yeah, in in the thing about you know with Judaism, well, yes, I mean, this like that conception of God is a very masculine conception of God. I mean, in terms of like the symbolic um, uh, epistemology of that, uh, and you know what I'm trying to do with my book, I guess, is to reincorporate, you know, the, is to, is to finish sort of the project that, that Jordan started in Maps of Meaning, which, mm. was, and, and also synthesize it with somebody like, um, Alfred North Whitehead. So, you know, Jordan, Jordan shifted our understanding of morality from stasis to process and mm -hmm. Whitehead shifted our understanding of ontology from substance and stasis to process. And like, mm. I, I think they were barking up the same tree, you know, and, uh, and, what was strange so whitehead whitehead was like this mathematician and uh uh and he constructed this, this metaphysical system on the basis of to his mind quantum theory quantum mechanics and mm. relativity like turned over the apple cart for western ontology okay yeah and, uh, anyway like you know a substack i'm gonna write soon is about you know whitehead weirdly enough whitehead inserted god into his metaphysical system which is mm. for somebody like him because he was like this sort of, you know, very uh, logical, you know, philosophical type. And um, but Whitehead's God is is Jordan Peterson's God. They're, it's the mm. same, you know, and this I think you can make a pretty good argument. They were they were getting at the same. 
Mm. Uh, so anyways, um, I guess that's all I, all I had. Um, uh, you got anything else you want to talk about? Um, I don't think so. I really enjoyed this, this conversation. Uh, I hope folks get something out of it. Um, I'm rooting for Jordan Peterson. You know, I hope he finds his way. Um, and yeah, I just, I love this conversation and I love the, um, the very simple and easy sort of like philosophical bantering. I'm always a fan of that. So thank you for, you know, inviting me on. Yeah. Well, thanks for, thanks for being here. And yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, it, it is weird to talk about somebody for me, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it, it comes from a place of love and, and, yeah. and, and Jordan was hugely influ- influential in my life. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I wish him all the best. And I, I hope that, um, yeah, I hope that whatever happens in the future, we can get back to something that's a little less polarizing and, you know, all of that. So anyway, absolutely. Thanks again, Chloe. Uh, Thank you. Yep. See you. Take care.